Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, for those of you who are not here last year, uh, this is the continuation of the brain, brain trust we were in last year called Black Money Matters. And uh, our gracious host today is uh, obviously Congressman Rush. And we have a great distinguished group of panelists uh, talking about income, income, income. Uh, we have a compendium here. I think everyone's got a copy of it. There's a lot of articles. We, at Physic, we spend a lot of time researching the state of the economy, black wealth, black income, uh, quality of the workforce, et cetera. And the one thing that keeps coming back is that no matter what problem you want to solve in America, especially for black Americans, uh, if you start with money, you solve most of those problems. So we focus a lot on taking advantage of the workforce. Uh, there's 7.5 million unfilled jobs in America, and African-American workforce participation is hovering somewhere under 50%. Um, we have Bill Cunningham here, who's an economist, he'll be able to tell us a little bit more detail about what that looks like. But you know, I will give you three stats that I didn't know that kind of frightened me, is that there are fewer black men going to medical school than there were in the 1970s. There are 300,000 persons shortage of pilots in America, and African Americans make up less than 1% of the current population. Utility linemen, we make up less than 1% of utility linemen. Those all seem kind of odd, except for those jobs all pay $100,000 a year, and we don't have any of them. Um, it's almost as if they'd rather have the jobs left unfilled than to give them to us. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how we can turn that pop. If we got 10% of those jobs, black wealth would you know, quadruple, maybe grow a thousand times. But what's the number? How much would it grow? About a thousand? Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's really one of these things that we have to spend time focusing on, or else we're never going to catch up with any of the, the stats about how much we make, how, how the disparity in our incomes. So I usually show a video when I do these about Lee Atwater talking about the Southern strategy and how Republicans use innocuous terms such as tax cuts to substitute for racism. Um, and I use it to, to demonstrate the fact that just because people think we're paranoid, doesn't mean people are not to get us. <laughs> and so um, from that thing, from there, we're going to start the panel. And the way I'm going to do it is everyone's going to get a chance to introduce themselves, five minute presentation, then we'll do Q&A, and from there we will um, close out. But you're getting in for a real treat. There's a real good, good group of people here. There's a lot going on in the economy, from opportunity zones to workforce to, I mean, there's to lack of savings to housing, et cetera. So we're going to, um, this, this group here will be able to cover most of that and give you a really good, a really good um, overview. So we'll start here. Hello. <laughs> My name is Miko Branch, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Miss Jessie's, the natural hair care brand that I created from scratch with my sister Titi Branch in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we are considered pioneer, pioneers and trailblazers in the beauty business, and uh, we specialize in all things curls, kinks, and waves. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Akuna Cook. Um, can you hear me? Okay. My name is Akuna Cook, and I am a policy advocate and strategist. Um, I currently serve as a senior advisor at the Black Economic Alliance, where I actually was the founding executive director and, and was in that position up until about a month ago. Um, I have spent most, most of my career um, first as a foreign service officer at the State Department working on development issues that affect people of color, so looking at the diaspora in Africa around the world. And then um, after getting my law degree at Yale, I started doing um, work on political work. So I started doing redistricting. I worked with Eric Holder, former attorney general, before I started working on donor advising. Um, the Black Economic Alliance was, is still focused on work, wages, and wealth in the black community. And I know that we'll be talking about a lot of the topics um, that we were focused on and that I've, I've worked with other donor groups to focus on in terms of building wealth and building uh, income in, in um, 
and uh, economic prosperity in black communities. And so I'm really pleased to be here with you and thank you to uh, Congressman Rush for inviting me today. Congressman? Do you want to say something? I'm Congressman Bobby Rush. I represent the first district of Illinois. So I will say this, uh, you know, Congressman Rush, one of the cool things about work with Congress Rush, one of the things that's really um, gratifying about this project is, you know, since his days as a Black Panther, all the way through his time in Congress, he's been focused on, you know, ways to empower. And you know, he doesn't take a lot of credit for it. I mean, he works tirelessly, and he is truly dedicated to this process. Um, you know, you can come to him with any ideas. I brought him one yesterday that was, you know, complicated, but he was willing to dig deep to try to find ways to help people, and so we are always committed. I mean, we started this with black banks, what, three years ago, trying to save black banks. So he is uh, always at the forefront of fighting for these, fighting these battles. So uh, I know he won't take credit for himself, but I wanted to make sure I said that. So, right. Samantha. Thank you, Kevin, um, and thanks to Congressman Rush and the organizers for having me back again. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Sam Sanders. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Program and Strategy at the Groundwork Collaborative. We're a new nonprofit organization based here in DC, um, and we're committed to advancing a, what I would say is aggressively progressive worldview um, on the economy and making sure that the economy is tied to all different kinds of social justice fights, um, advocacies, and struggles, right? Um, and one thing that's really central to our worldview and the way we do our work is that you know, racial oppression and racial discrimina uh, discrimination and marginalization and economic oppression and marginalization are super entwined, and you can't have one without the other, and you can't solve one uh, without addressing all of the systems that prop the other up. Um, so I focused on a lot of policy work, mostly in the labor space, um, also on race, ethnicity, and the economy, taxes, and a lot of other things. And so I look forward to talking about um, a policy-focused solutions approach to some of the issues we're talking about today. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me? I'll just borrow, I'll just borrow samples. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nikia Pipiyan McGriff. I am a broker, a real estate broker in Chicago. Uh, but beyond buying and selling, I am actually very actively involved in the real estate community. I serve as a federal political coordinator for the National Association of Realtors, which means I get to uh, bother Congressman Rush and team about all the policy issues that impact uh, property owners' uh, rights. So heavily involved in the policy, and I am all about educating not only other real estate practitioners to in increase their income, but really all of us. How are we going to increase our wealth opportunities through home ownership? So Bill, go ahead. All right. So I'm Bill Cunningham. I'm an economist, uh, DC native, born and raised. Uh, I'm here to talk about the numbers. And, and by the way, I'm just the numbers guy. Okay, I'm just, I'm going to say some stuff which, and, and again, thank you Congressman Rush, because there's nobody else on Capitol Hill who will work with me, because <laughs> I am just, they won't, they won't. I focus on exactly what the numbers say, exactly, and I've been doing it for 30 years, so I appreciate that. Now, one other thing, lastly, let me introduce Jean-Claude Beaujour, please stand up, sir. Uh, he's a special guest, former candidate for the mayor of Paris and is here uh, establishing international connections. Thank you, sir. So we're going to get started. I'm going to let Bill go through the numbers, um, which will get everyone fired up. Oh, no, no. Generally, I go last. I kind of prefer to go last because, you know, again, I'm, get us fired. I'm not messing around. I'm going to kind of lay it out in terms of what the situation is. So I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint here, so, and I'm going to wander up in front. Uh, and by the way, how many people were here last year? How many people attended last year? Good, good. Because this is the second part of the class. So if you were here last year, you heard me say, take notes, you know, that I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Uh, and I'm going to be very, very direct. So next slide, please. Hit enter. Uh, yes, I think. Um, it's on the, oh, wait a minute. Let me come back up. Oh, just the, the arrow right there. Yeah. All right, so this is the update from the data that we covered last year. This shows the total wealth in the United States of America. 
The total wealth in the United States of America. This is data from the Federal Reserve. The reason I put this up is for one reason only. I want you to note the changes. This is a change from what we did last year to this year. So it shows that the wealth of households, 35 trillion, increased by 1.2 trillion. The wealth of small businesses increased by about 0.89 trillion. The market value of corporations increased by 3.2 trillion and the wealth of federal, state, and local governments increased by, a point, by about 0.796 trillion. So the gains, the gains from when we were here last year to today, the gains have all gone to corporations. Corpor and that's because of the tax plan, the charitably, to call it a plan is charitable, you know, but the tax giveaway that the Trump administration put into place. Now the issue with this is that we're not opposed to corporations making money at all, at all. But certainly the distribution is the issue. What happens if this particular distribution continues to run out for 20 or 30 years? Uh, all of the money winds up uh, in very few hands. So next slide please. And again, continuing from last year, this shows the wealth distribution by ethnic groups. So you see that the median white family wealth, 171,000. Asians, median wealth, 64,000. Hispanic, median wealth, 20,000. And black people, median wealth, 17,000. So basically this says, when, when you hear the stats about how people are talking about how black people have $10 for every $100 of white wealth, this is what they're referring to. This is wrong, by the way. This is wrong. If you take out automobiles, if you take out automobiles, black people have $2 for every $100 of white wealth. Okay? The bulk of this is your auto. They include that as part of your wealth. So the situation is even worse than these statistics would lead you to believe. And lastly, on this slide, people always talk about buying power. Oh, we got $2 trillion in buying power. We're light by about a trillion dollars in buying power. Also, buying power is income, not wealth. Income, not wealth. Every dollar of that two trillion is accounted for with respect to black people, and we're missing another dollar. So that's kind of the issue. When they talk about buying power, please ignore them because it's income, not wealth. Next slide, please. All right, as we said last year, we came up with some ideas, because Keevan is always, and again, this is one of the reasons why the congressman works with me, Keevan is always pressing me to come up with solutions. He's like, Bill, I know, I know that we only got $2 for every $100, but what do we do about it? So this was our attempt at starting to take a look at some potential solutions. I just want to put them up on the board right now, because basically we are going to update these for 2019. So what we said was finance, stick to credit unions. What we said was, on the media side, we need our own media platform. We know Trump has his own media platform, it's called Fox News. So we need one of our own. And also, the legal side. All of the laws that we need to change the current economic situation are in place right now. The problem is that they are not enforced to the extent that they were in the 1960s and 1970s. So re-emphasizing. A legal approach is one of the things that I suggest. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So one of the other questions that he even tasked me with answering was why is the wealth gap so persistent? It's so persistent because of your position in this country. White people are going to steal everything from you that they can. They have for 400 freaking years. What makes you think that they're going to stop now? And what I'm talking about is 1772, Thomas Jefferson mortgaged 150 of his forced workers to a Dutch firm to build Monticello. What that says to me is that Monticello belongs to us. There should be a legal strategy where we go back in and actually take title to Monticello. Because, you know, we were basically the people that financed it. And then, of course, 1874, the failure of Freedman's Bank had detrimental effects on the attitudes of black people with respect to finance. 
That's where part of the lack of trust concerning regulated financial institutions originated. It was devastating, absolutely devastating, to a population that had just been free and had scrambled to save up their little pennies and put them in this bank to have this bank go down. And they never got compensated for that. And then, and then, if you think that's going back too far, well, black media net worth decreased 61% from 2005 to 2009 because black communities were targeted by predatory financial institutions, the number one of which is Wells Fargo. Thank you. So you know I'm not making this stuff up. Y'all know this stuff. Y'all know this stuff. So don't do business with Wells Fargo. Focus on credit unions. Focus on credit unions. Uh, now, here's the other thing. This is the part that's really uh, a competitive, or actually controversial. So the other issue is the competition that we face in the labor markets. One of the things, again, that Keevan tasked me with this year was focusing on income. So if you're talking income, you're talking jobs. What's the problem with black people and jobs? On the low end of the job scale, we face competition from immigrants, from Mexico. Okay? Over the course of the past 20 years, they've come into the labor market, taken out a lot of the low-income jobs that used to go to black people. Construction, cleaning, all of those sorts of things. The only jobs you can get right now, if you're a black female, is as a security guard. Okay? But there used to be a whole range of jobs that you could get. But we face competition from that sector in that particular labor market. What's the problem on the upper end? The problem on the upper end is the competition that we face from East Indians and Asians. So we're trapped. We're trapped right in the middle. At the, the high wage jobs, we face this competition from very good, very talented uh, uh, people from India and Asia. And if you recall, if you remember, if you look at some of the old movies about science fiction, you'll see that whenever they went to a computer room, all the people in the computer, I'm talking 1960, 65, 66, they were all black. All of those jobs in data processing originally were held by black people. You don't believe me? Talk to a group called the Black Data Processors in DC. They will confirm that. So all of those jobs got kind of taken away. And we won't even talk about the innovations that we put forward with respect to computer hardware. Um, you know, a lot of which were, were actually black people coming up with stuff, which is very, very hit. Uh, and then again, on the lower end of the market, we face this incredible competition from populations from every country but here. So we're trapped kind of in that middle. That is a policy issue that needs to be addressed. Again, I'm just the numbers guy. I'm not anti-Mexican, I'm not anti-Indian, I'm not anti-immigrant at all. But when I look at the numbers and I say, where's the pressure coming from? It's coming from those two strata. So next slide, please. All right, and then talking about black banks. Um, we estimated in 2011 that there would be seven black banks by 2028. 2011, we issued a forecast that said that there would be seven black banks by 2028. We were optimistic. <laughs> we were optimistic. There are 15 black banks right now, down from 55 in 1994. Now that is no accident. The way that the economy operates, assets are increasingly concentrated in fewer and fewer institutional hands. It's why Wells Fargo is so big, it's why there's an asset management firm called BlackRock uh, uh, that's absolutely huge. I think they have $5.6 trillion. So all of these assets that used to exist in these little pots of money, including some that were in our hands, they're all being centralized up to one set of institutions. That is very bad from a long-term perspective. And by the way, that all comes out of the economic theories of the school that I went to. University of Chicago, free market, Milton Friedman. This is what they said, oh no, business is good, you should concentrate on, no, no. It doesn't work from a social justice perspective, from a long-term social justice economic perspective. They missed that because they weren't even thinking about that. It wasn't a concern to them. All they were concerned about was developing theories that would allow them to maximize what's called shareholder value. And we know, as Bobby Kennedy said, shareholder value measures everything except what makes life worthwhile. I tried to tell them that. You know, didn't work for me, you know, but now people are coming around to that viewpoint. 
So next slide, please. All right, and the gap in entrepreneurship. <laughs> this is another controversial part of this presentation. And I hate to say it, a couple of white people here, you know, I don't want y'all going around telling that, saying that I said this. The future of black economic development rests in the hands of black women. It always has, it always has. But right now, right now, black women, all right, and the reason why I'm cautious about saying this is because if I wanted to delay or defray or stop black economic development, the group that I would attack are black women. Black women. So here's how my forecasting style works. I just said that. So what you have to do is you have to look for an increase in attacks on which you're going to see, which you already have seen. So, so this is kind of our forecasting style. This is how we work. Okay? We do run the numbers. We look at exactly what's going on. We say, look, this, if the numbers are right, this is what you're going to see. And over the course of a 25-year career, the reason I'm here today is because we've been right. So that's just something to keep in mind and to develop policies to lessen the damage caused by those attacks when they come. Okay? Next slide, please. All right. Cultural appropriation. Well, as I said, white people are going to steal everything they can from you they have for 400 years. This was another part of it. This is another part of it. Stealing every part of your culture so you can't make a dime. And personally, it affects, it affects my firm and our company because we've developed a lot of the marquee financial products that are currently in use in the United States. What do I mean by that? Uh, crowdfunding. If you look at our website, you'll see an article from 1993 where we had requested and suggested that banks develop a financial product called a key from the Korean culture. A key is nothing more than a loan pool. Uh, we looked around, we said, how are all these Chinese chicken joints showing up in Southeast Washington, D.C.? So we went and talked to people, you know, and they said, well, what we're doing is we're pooling our money. So Joe here gets $10,000. He opens a Chinese joint at Martin Luther King and Good Hope Road. That works. Joe is able to pay that money back in a year, we take his $10,000, we open up one around the corner. And then we take that $10,000, there's a way to formalize that investment strategy. It's called crowdfunding. Now, now it's called crowdfunding. Uh, but we have recommended that. So uh, again, the issue here is with the overarching theory, philosophy of the economy, which is to steal as much as you can from people who cannot defend themselves and make sure, by the way, that they cannot defend themselves. So that's what's going on, in my opinion, with respect to cultural uh, appropriation. Next slide, please. All right, so mass incarceration. This is one of my favorite slides. Let's walk through this really quickly. I'm gonna go right down here. This is the number of actual black prisoners in prison right now, 475,137. Is the average wage rate in the United States of America $54,000? So if you take this number and multiply it by that number, you get this number $25 billion in lost wages to the black community on an annual basis by having 475,000 people locked up. Now, let me say this of that 475, about half of them should be locked up, okay? <laughs> Y'all know that. Y'all know that. <laughs> So, because so they crazy, they crazy as hell. I'm not saying, so I'm not saying that we would get, if, if you had a completely fair system, that we would get $25 billion a year. I'm not saying that. But we would get somewhere between zero and 12.5 billion in our community. And that's a dead weight loss. That's a loss of income that you just don't see. And you know what that can do for your community in terms of businesses, houses, spending, car, everything. So you're losing $25 billion a year, uh, basically because people, a significant percentage of your population is incarcerated. Now the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at this. Now, this is the percentage of the US population represented by each group. Um, so 
the white, 64% of the population, blacks, 13%, Hispanics, 16%. So if you locked up people based on their share in the population, whites would represent 921,000 of the incarcerated population, blacks would only be 187,000 of the incarcerated population, Hispanics 230,000. The point here is that our real number, our true number, the number that should be locked up is somewhere between 475,000 and 187,000. I don't know quite where it is in there. But it's not, it, it definitely, this number is too high. Definitely, 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 okay? But it should, I'm not saying it should be zero. Probably somewhere in this area. All right, next slide, please, and then we'll wrap this up real quickly. All right, home ownership, home ownership. Hugely important, key asset. Um, what happened during the financial crisis is that all of the wealth that black people had accumulated from the civil rights era, from 1960 to about, the year 2000 was extracted back out of the black community by predatory financial institutions who were purposefully targeting the black community with lending products that made no sense. They made no sense. And please don't buy into the right-wing lie that you are responsible for the financial crisis, right? Oh, people were taking out these loans that they, no. The final responsibility for any financing decision rests with the financial institution making that decision. It can't possibly be your fault. So this is part of what was going on was that that wealth was extracted back. Now in terms of solutions, we suggest energy efficient mortgages. Uh, we created an anti-predatory lending investment vehicle. The way to get around the financial crisis was as follows. All you had to do, and we did this in Minneapolis, all you had to do was extinguish the predatory loans. What you say is, financial institution, you've made a loan based on false promises. That is illegal, right? The people signing that contract did not know that you were lying to them. Therefore, that loan is no longer valid. That loan, you cancel the loan. This is what we suggested. We actually did that in Minneapolis, and we suggested that the Obama administration do that. You can imagine, you know, uh, what their uh, reaction was. But that would have taken care of the crisis in toto because the financial institutions would then have made sure that they made fair loans. If you say, look, you make a bad loan, it's on you. We're gonna cancel it. And we're gonna give the money to the people that you made the loan to. Because you lied to them, you know. You do that, I guarantee you, you won't have a problem with predatory lending. And then the other thing, I talked about the key applied to black neighborhood community development. That was actually from June 29th, 1992, when we suggested that. So next slide, please. Ah, reparations. Ah, one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite topics. Right? Look, look, look. We're not getting reparations. <laughs> Here's why we're not getting reparations. In order to get fair reparations, white people would have to pay us on the order of $10 trillion. That would be a fair dollar amount for reparations. White people ain't paying us $10 trillion, okay? So if they'll come and they'll offer you $500 billion. Oh, are we, are we giving these, these black people $500 billion? You know, they'll break their arms patting themselves on the back. So any deal that you would accept would be less than you should get. So don't do it. And the, here's the other issue. The other issues are as follows. You'd have to identify all descendants of slaves to calculate where to put that money. Now we know that we can do that through DNA testing. The reason why white people won't do that is it would show, a lot of them would show up as black. <laughs> a lot of them would show, oh my goodness, a lot of them would show up as black. So they're not gonna do a DNA test on the entire population. The, and, and then the other issue is, let's assume that we got $10 trillion. The interference that you would get from low-income whites, you see how they are now. Can you imagine if somebody showed up to the black community with $10 trillion, what, what poor white people would do? They'd lose their minds, you know? So, so it doesn't make sense. You, you, the dollar amount you're gonna get is not gonna be fair, you know? You're not gonna know how to distribute it, uh, for the most part. And then you have to do the identity test, which can be done and which will be done. I think 50 years from now, I think the country will do 
a complete DNA testing type of uh, uh, thing, but not for this purpose. So next slide, please. Oh, and finally, finally, increasing the minimum wage. Yes, yes. If there's one policy recommendation that I can make right now that would have a huge impact on the black community right away, it would be increasing the minimum wage. And I don't mean increasing the minimum wage by a little. I mean really jacking that sucker up, okay? <laughs> That's the thing that would have the, the best economic impact for black people. Because we're, we are in those positions if we're in any positions at all. So, I think that about covers it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Email me at info at creativeinvest.com. Info at creativeinvest.com. Okay. Well, so the good thing about having Bill go first is that he lays out everything, and now, now your mind's open to all the conversations. So, uh, although Bill, you did one thing you didn't answer in that slide was in our incarceration. How do you factor in people who are on probation and parole who can't get hired? I mean, where does that number go? Well, it just increased that $25 billion mm -hmm. goes up. Okay. okay. So, so, I don't even know where to start. So, I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we think about, you're an entrepreneur, and you know, you've been around for a while. You probably don't have the same, like some of those numbers about access to capital. What do you, what do you see in the community, and how do you view? how we get from where we are to where we're going in terms of widespread kind of duplicative efforts that will increase wealth and income. I think I could better serve this audience by just simply sharing my story on how my sister and I didn't have access to loans or capital, but we built our capital ourselves. We did things like uh, pool our, our talents together. My sister Titi was a wonderful organizer. She was a great communicator. I was a great hairstylist. And what we did was we joined forces. My sister Titi called every single person in New York City and she wanted to know if they needed a hairstylist. Thank God Ashley Stewart needed a hairstylist for one week worth of work and I was able to make $8,000 where my sister and I split that money in half. From there, we opened our first storefront salon in the Borum Hill section of Brooklyn, and slowly but surely, we were able to build capital. It didn't just start there. I mean, we didn't have any sophisticated or um, we didn't have any special contacts, but it didn't just stop there in that we got our salon, but we had to continue to build capital in order to stay in business. So what did we do? Uh, in my early 20s and in my 30s, we grew up in New York during a very exciting time called the Puffy Era, where many of our friends were doing things like spending money on, particularly women, their Chanel bags or their Gucci, and they, were, they wanted to be at these parties. So Titi and I did things like sacrifice. We took in a roommate. We kept overhead low. We drove the same car. We wore the same clothes, and we made sure we kept overhead low, but we put a premium on our services and on our products. And with that equation, we were able to build capital slowly but surely where we were able to avoid uh, getting loans from banks. Right now, uh, banks are begging me to take a loan out. Um, but back then, as we were building capital, we did it the old-fashioned way. And although it was a slow build, when the profits started coming in, we were able to keep all of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, you're a researcher, you're in this, you know, how do your numbers, or what do you see And we try to figure out a way to move <laughs> forward in terms of the, you know, the, if you compare us to the dis diaspora and overseas, African Americans, Africans around the world, what are we doing wrong or what are they doing right or are we all doing it wrong? I mean, wealth seems to be elusive for all of us everywhere. So I, I think that, So I think that uh, Dr. Cunningham's presentation was fantastic. And I think the next step is to talk about the public policy that is needed to address some of these issues. Um, and so, you know, I love the story about uh, ingenuity and using, you know, what you already have to build capital. But let's be clear, that's not how 
the other <laughs> folks have to do it. They have access to capital. And that's capital that should be available to black women who, as we all discussed, are the engines of uh, uh, prosperity in the, in the African American community, and frankly, also in African communities. And so we need to be thinking about the public policies that we should be pushing for to ensure that access to capital is fair, to ensure that it's not 60 plus percent of venture capital that's going to whites, 20 percent going to Asians, and less than 1 percent to blacks. Right? So we need to be making sure and pushing that we're actually getting these public policies. And you know, I, um, you know, uh, the Black Economic Alliance, we did a, a poll uh, around the country with black uh, folks around the country talking of various uh, economic issues. And reparations did come up. And I think somewhere around 65% or so uh, black Americans were in favor of reparations. But the hang up is what uh, Dr. Cunningham mentioned. How would you implement it? What does it look like? And I think we should, as you know, we, we're in the midst of a presidential election, we're looking at 2020, we are looking at leaders at the state level, federal level that are running for office. I think we should be holding them accountable for making sure that the policies they're putting forward address what has been a long and systemic gap between wealth and income and uh, a, a, all the economic uh, indicators between black communities and others. And when it comes to reparations, maybe it does not look like, uh, you know, it's not gonna look like a check or, you know, for all the reasons that uh, Dr. Cunningham mentioned, but it can look like investments in our neighborhood. It can look like investments in education and it can look like preparing our communities for the future of work because we're talking about the jobs that are leaving, but what we're not talking about is the jobs that are gonna be leaving as a result of automation, most of which are going to impact the black community even more. And so there has to be a public policy response to deal with what we're dealing with right now, the realities of what's happening in our communities right now, and I don't think we should be letting our policymakers off the hook for doing their jobs and ensuring that all American citizens have equal opportunity. So, Congressman, I'll put you on the spot if you don't mind for a second. You've been in this fight a long time. I mean, yeah. you know, and when you when when you in the when you were a young man, you were you were in the Panthers, and you guys had plans and ideas, you know, and you dreamed of that utopia. You know, what do you think went wrong, or what do you think? Do we miss something? Do we do we did they just outwit? Did they out? flank us in this process? I mean, or what do we, what needs to be done? What steps did we miss? Well, I don't think that we miss any steps. I just think that we uh, short-circuited our journey. We got diverted and, into, and distracted. Uh, and our focus became more, uh, <clears throat> more much more prominent than it really should have been. You know, I, 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 I come from the position that uh, the black community can fix itself in the beginning. And that is that we as black families, black individuals have the, the capacity to repair itself if in fact it focuses in the right direction. Uh, you know, to me, our, one of our basic problems is that we don't really, we're not really <clears throat> a joint in terms of using the dollars that we do have right now, or allowing the dollars that we do have to be uh, <clears throat> abused by others. Uh, and by those who are, and, and uh, my friend, uh, the doctor said, those who are really have, are hell bent on taking everything that you have. You know, consumerism uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a power that we all have. We are, we are, we are, we are some of the best consumers on the face of the earth. You know, we have we, we want to we want the latest, the biggest, 
and the most advertised, you know, because we want to show that we are just as great as, as anybody else. So we were really uh, uh, stampede into a store to buy the latest gadget or the latest whatever uh, so that we can show that we are in the mix. But what happens is that since we are <clears throat> sometimes unapologetically black, but we're also unapologetically consumers. We don't have, we don't control uh, where our consumer dollars go. And not only that, we don't even control the products that we say. We don't control the retail stores in our own neighborhood. In Chicago last week, and uh, a housing forum that I, I spoke at, that Nikhil had organized. There was uh, one of the realtors brought to my attention the story of uh, I had missed it in, uh, in some of the local media about uh, some black women and one this one particular woman who went into a nail shop owned by Asian, and she got into confrontation with this agent because she couldn't make up her mind what color she wanted. <laughs> and there was really a physical altercation uh, there. And but when the camera spanned us the whole shop, there was wasn't an Asian, nor white, nor Hispanic in that shop, all black women. Right. You know, so we don't even take disrespect and abuse from someone who can't even speak the language, but they know how to fix uh, Good stuff. new nail. And I'm just saying that's an abuse, and that, that's, a, that's a one little minor, small indication of the kind of abuse that we take as consumers. But as an organizer, I'm saying, well, what is wrong with us? Why do everybody from the from the mortgages to the meat no to the meat store. Why are we always victims? And my the answer that I can come up and that I knew come up based on my history in the sixties is that we don't organize. You know, there's not a black consumer advocacy organization in America. Why not? We, every day in, in every community, every block in the black community in America, they are faced with this constant battle in terms of abuse of our consumer, our, 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 our dollars. And so I, I don't think that, you know, I, I said this last, in the last session, I'm gonna say it again today. We gotta learn to do for self. Self-reliance is something that we don't take advantage of. And we don't, you know, from uh, income to investments, where are we located at strategically? And I'm, I don't wanna always talk about the problem. So I do believe that the, that the solution is in terms of us organizing around some of these issues of, uh, of the battle, the consumer battle, that we have to fight daily, uh, and vigorously throughout our community. Now, is there a role for federal policy makers? Yes, absolutely. You know, I have an article uh, uh, about Chicago from 19, from 1960, 19, between the year 1934 and 1963, black homeowners paid $71,000 more for their homes than white homeowners. In Chicago, uh, these disparities and other racist policies, such as red lines, have resulted in $3.2 million, $3.2 million being extracted 
from our community, our community is being plundered through federal policy. And that's just one federal policy. So do we, do the, do the federal policy makers, do Congress have a role? Absolutely, they have a role. But I think that they they will realize they will do their role if, in fact, there was more aggressive grassroots advocacy of, 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 among black consumers. We need to have uh, not one, we need to have multiple black consumer organizations to fight against these abuses that we are confronted with day by day in the black community uh, from everybody, from whites, from Asian, from Hispanic, everybody comes to the black community to get their wealth to steal the wealth of the black community. And when are we going to say no, no more? We're going to conserve our money. We're going to organize. If you hear it, you hear it as our guest, and that means that you will give us your best or you won't be here long. And that's what, you know, that's, that's what I see. I, I really believe that we have to uh, expand uh, uh, and our organizing efforts and expand our consciousness to the economic arena. Uh, and it's important because I think that even uh, 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 in the diaspora, <clears throat> the black community and our economics and our understanding and our know-how is needed so much in places all, all around, uh, in the diaspora, in Africa, uh, in other places. So, I mean, the world is really ours for the taking. It's just that we got to be uh, smart enough and courageous enough and bad enough to take it. <laughs> so Sam, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that ball in your lap and ask this question. You really want me to start? <laughs> yeah. So you you're a researcher, and Bill and I've had this conversation, and we had a conversation yesterday about this. You know, one of the you know the congressman talked about creating a, a consumer organization. <coughs> We are locked out, and this is to your point, locked out of the funding mechanisms. You know, the, the Koch brothers fund every right wing organization in the world. You know, African American leaders, uh, you know, business guys, people who have money, don't invest in black think tanks. I mean, all these studies that you guys see in this pamphlet here were done by white people, right? Yeah. No black person, even the articles about black banks or the studies about, about black banks are being done by white people. Studies about black people getting investment money has been done by white people. So we can't, in order for us to engage, I think the congressman, to your point, is we've got to get people who have the money, the, the John Rogers, I hate to call it people names, but people like the people who actually have money to invest. When the Koch brothers wanted to get rid of the estate tax, they put a billion dollars over 30 years to get rid of the estate tax. We have to invest at that level for ourselves. And Sam, you have a think tank, so I'll throw that to you. Um, sure. I guess I think I would expand outward from that a little bit and say that I don't actually think that the amount of money that right-wing causes are able to push into preserving their conservative economic worldview is a good thing. Like, I totally understand fight fire with fire, all of that, right? Mm -hmm. But I think this idea, like, they also have a home field advantage in terms of white supremacy. They have a home field advantage in terms of the concentrations of wealth and power, right? Like, I think if you're talking about, I, I think a way that I like, like to approach a lot of economic issues is like who holds the power in any given dynamic or situation, whether it's political power, financial power, et cetera, right? And it's like, I do have to shout out the work of a couple of black think tanks. I know of just off the top of my head, the Black Economic Alliance among them, and also the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, if folks are looking for more work from that perspective specifically. But I also think just, you know, following up on what the congressman said, like, it is not research alone that is going to save us, right? We have to, a, a lot of people understand the problems that are happening in their own communities, right? And so I think it's a marriage of that research with also grassroots organizing, with advocacy experience, with the lived experiences of a lot of different people, right? I think all of those things have to work together if you're going to beat just like a straight up political money machine. 
Um, and I think on that front, you know, in terms of kind of, you know, you're talking about kind of political financing, but I think on the, uh, on the conversation around access to capital and things like that, again, I think we kind of need to shift our idea of like what success is, right? Like if you're constantly playing at like a game based on winning at the rules of like a system that is rigged against you, right? Like I don't think we're going to always have either the economic or policy outcomes that we actually want because like the way a lot of our political and economic system was designed was not centering black folks, was not centering any marginalized folks at all, right? And so um, I think, I, I feel like I have a bit of a worry sometimes that there's like a trap of like running up a down escalator to steal a phrase from like another colleague, which I think brings me back to the title of kind of the session. You know, last year we talked mostly about wealth. Um, Bill did a great job pointing out like the difference between wealth and income, right? Income is wages and earnings just to, highlight the income, income, income part of the title here today. I think a lot of what you need to do in terms of boosting income is focus on jobs, not just having jobs, but also improving the quality of jobs, right? What are people actually getting paid? Do people actually have benefits? Do people actually have health insurance? Do people actually have a voice on the job? Are they able to unionize and build worker power? Are they able to communicate and collaborate with a lot of other people to ensure that their rights are being respected? Are there things in place to make sure that they aren't being discriminated against, not just in job searching, but also when they're holding the jobs? So I think that has to be like a, a really big part of the conversation. Um, and I think I would just tack that onto what the congressman was mentioning about the need for organizing around consumer advocacy, because you also need to organize around worker advocacy. Black workers drive this economy in a lot of ways, right? Always have, paid and unpaid, right? Like for a lot of the history of this country. So, um, and that continues today. And yet I think a lot of the solutions that are sometimes talked about are kind of like, we need to get into higher paying jobs. We need to figure out what the hot, thing is this year, this decade, whatever, and try to succeed in that, that's always going to be changing. I think if we focus on improving things for everybody at the bottom, that is ultimately how we win. There are always going to be service workers in this economy. There's always going to be care workers doing incredibly vital work. There's always going to be domestic workers, right? And a lot of those things can't be automated or outsourced, right? So if we focus on improving the quality of life for people who are in those jobs, and again, also for people who can't work, for people who cannot join the workforce, there's lots of value for our society and our economy in a lot of the things that are outside of the officially paid like labor workforce. So I think we have to think about that as well and organizing, building a message, and pushing for policy advocacy at the federal, state, and local level that addresses all of those things. I really think you have to, you have to center people who have been the most marginalized in the past in order to have an economy that actually works for everyone. And I think, speaking of centering marginalized people, I do just, before I forget, and while I have the mic, want to jump back onto a couple points that um, Bill mentioned earlier, right, in this conversation about kind of competition in the labor market. Again, I would really just encourage everyone to come back to this question of who has the power in any of these dynamics, right? Is it immigrants in our communities who pass the multi-trillion dollar tax cut? No. Is it immigrants in the communities who systematically suppress the vote and make sure that black folks don't turn up and have elected officials who speak for them? No. Like, is it immigrants in our communities who you know, do all of the other things to create systemic public disinvestment in our communities, everything from schools to housing to public safety and all these other issues, no, right? And it's, I think also just wanna acknowledge, you know, the black community itself is incredibly diverse. There are immigrants in the black community in the US, right? There are folks of all different genders, there are folks of all different sexual orientations. We live in urban areas and rural areas, suburbs, and absolutely everything in between. Like, we are a very rich and diverse community as well, and I think there's not always gonna be a one-size-fits-all kind of solution, and I would say that in terms of when we're thinking about whether either the immigrant workforce, which, reminder, includes black folks and includes black and Latinx folks, right? Afro-Latinx folks are a part of our community as well, right? When you think about like how is that workforce affecting wages or affecting the availability of jobs or not, again, look at who's making the decisions. Look at who is actually employing people that way, suppressing wages, forcing people to live in the shadows, or offshoring labor overseas so that workers there can be oppressed and paid even lower wages, right? We, I think we really need to be thinking about um, solidarity across like a lot of those lines. Um, you know, there's enough to go around, and I just, I really don't think we should be fighting over scraps at this point. <laughs> We're going to touch on real estate since we've got you here, and you know, Bill and I's favorite topic: opportunity zones. Um, we know that you know, the real estate market has not been kind to African Americans. We know that the real estate market has been kind to real estate professionals, as you pointed Absolutely. out. 
talk to me of taking what Sam said with the congressman about you know, activism, consumerism, consumer consumerism, but consumer advocacy. How does that play? Because since, since home ownership is a, one of the greatest wealth builders, how does all that work? What do you see as a policy, even the policy initiative or your complaint or suggestion? What do you What do you think? Well, there's a twofold approach. Um, first of all, I want to share some stats with you guys. So National Association of Realtors does a member profile every year, and I want to share some stats with you guys. Uh, and this is based on the respondents. We have about 1.3 million realtor members. Um, from those that responded, African American respondents, only 2% of those that responded are commercial experts or specialists. 2%. So that means 98% of the, us are practicing only in residential. And we all know that the money is in commercial. <laughs> is it not? So that is another area that we need to increase. Uh, only 47 of the people that responded indicated that real estate is their only profession. Wow. wow. <laughs> so we're working multiple jobs. Our average leasing slash sales volume is 340000 a year. Wow. And income, so this is the biggest one, we're only making $14,750 a year, gross wow. income. As a realtor? As an African-American realtor. So each one of us in the room plays a part in that because when you last rented your property, who did you hire? Yeah. Bingo. Mm -hmm. So there's consumerism. That's a consumer, uh, mm -hmm. a direct impact that you can have is to make sure that you're partnering with the realtor and realtors in your community because we are operating small businesses. Uh, some other fun stats. I want to uh, talk about, has anyone seen a distressed property yeah. in their neighborhood? What'd you do? We just, drove by, we just drove past it. So you need to be educating yourselves about how can I own that vacant property, that blight, instead of complaining about it. So you need to partner with like your local land banks. So for example, Cook County Land Bank in uh, the sh Chicago market buys up has about, I think, 3,500 properties that we can go in, and they range from $7,000 to, I think the highest that I've seen is about $65,000. That means that me, a regular person, I can go in uh, through their home buyer direct program, purchase that property, rehab it. Ideally, I would want to live in it, right? But if I decided I wanted to uh, do some of the rehabbing and the flipping, they're partnering with the lenders to provide us with capital to do so. So we've got to take it upon ourselves to educate ourselves and educate your friends and your family. And uh, a couple of the panelists talked about pooling. We don't do that in our community. I take my little refund and I go go buy something flashy as opposed to partnering with Samantha and partnering with Bill and saying, hey, let's go invest in this two unit that's been vacant in our community for the last six years. So those are a couple of opportunities um, and it's really about educating yourself. Yes, it is a, a rigged game, but you've got to figure out uh, what opportunities are in that community or in your area to help you. Uh, as it relates to my real estate professionals that are in the room, we've got to operate this as a business. That means you've got to constantly be learning and educating yourself so that you're representing your clients and providing them with the new grant programs, providing them information about NACA, for example, to help people that are struggling. Because I don't just make money, I spend a lot of time advocating to keep homeowners, keep my seniors in their home. So I spend a lot of time educating myself about different programs so that I am a resource to the community, that I'm not just making money, and, and I showed you guys the numbers of 14750 gross income but I'm also there as an advocate for those in my community. Has anyone heard of the Presidential Center, the Presidential Obama Center that's coming? Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get into the politics of it, <laughs> but I'm gonna share another stat. So it's gonna be in what's called the Woodlawn Community in Chicago. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, have you heard of uh, University of Chicago? Yeah. Woodlawn is the neighboring community immediately south of University of Chicago campus. Um, in August of 2016, the median sales price for all properties in the Woodlawn community was $74,000. Nobody shocked by that? Yes, it's just low, yes. August of 19, we're at 175. Wow. So for those, and, and I need you guys, when you go visit Chicago, to drive around Woodlawn. 
It's yeah. still very blighted, it's still lots of vacant lots, all that fun stuff. But it's been like that for years, and we did not invest in our own community, and now we can't afford to. So those are just a few fun real estate stats for you. One, one, <laughs> side, one side note, of the, I want to ask you a question. Real estate appraisers, because we noticed there's a shortage of real estate appraisers in America, and the African American real estate appraisers are underutilized at best, and that instead of giving more work to African American real estate appraisers, they actually changed the rules so that people could come from out of state. It's harder, yeah. yeah. Can you expand on that at all? Well, I think, number one, the challenge is it's made it harder to become a, a, an appraiser. So yeah. that's prevented most of us to, uh, to get that specialty. But the other piece of it is, again, I got to talk about Chicago. Has anybody heard of like Highland Park, Barrington? Yeah. An appraiser from Barrington does not know Woodlawn. Right. So I need people who are familiar with my community. And again, my practitioners have to be that specialist to say, where are you from? Mm -hmm. How many properties have you appraised in the Woodlawn community or Bronzeville community mm -hmm. or Austin, mm -hmm. right? I have got to be able to be prepared enough to ask that question of that appraiser and then demand from that lender that you send me someone who's familiar with my community because Beverly and Morgan Park on the south side are not the same. You know, we've heard that you, you can, it can differ by as much as 20% the value of a property depending on the appraiser. Is that that's yeah, it. I mean, the values are all subjective. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, one of the practices that I have is that, um, you know, I have my comps ready. Uh -huh. yeah. not, the, not to say that the Mr. or Mrs. Appraiser doesn't know what they're doing. I always just say, hey, well, you know what, I'm sure you're busy. You've got 15 of these. I'm just kind of help you with uh, your workload here. Um, because, again, that's going to impact whether my seller is going to be able to get the value that they need out of that property. But we're definitely seeing still a... We're seeing trouble with getting the value in the minority communities, as opposed to other pockets of the city of Chicago, for example. So let me ask you one, another question on opportunity zones, because obviously a lot of blighted communities, a lot of, are you seeing any movement at all? So tomorrow we're actually doing a, a panel. I testified at Treasury, so to bill against opportunity zones. We, were, it's, we, we perceive it as a real detriment to communities. What do you see as a real, I mean, are, you, are there any opportunity funds you're working with? Or you, we haven't heard, we've heard there's some black opportunity funds who've gotten a little, and I don't, I'm sorry, opportunity zones, some of you may not know, it's the treasury program, tax cut program that allows you to invest your after tax um, capital gains tax free in certain areas. Mm -hmm. It's about 100 trillion, about, I guess 100 trillion dollars worth of investments will take place, I'm sorry, 100 trillion, 10 trillion dollars worth of investments will take place over like the next five years under this program. And we're, we've been concerned, a lot of people are concerned that it will, it will gentrify communities, like all those blighted areas you're talking about, there'll be a lot of free money to go in and wipe those areas out mm -hmm. under this program. And we don't think any African Americans will be able to take advantage of it because we can't raise the money because you have to find an investor to give you the money. And so that's a difficult thing for us. So your partners. Two pieces to that. Number one, who here has capital gains to, to take part of this? He does. OK. We like a couple, of you, about, a couple about, of you in the room. We're, 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 there's that issue. Uh, the second piece is the community has to demand that you make, you make the community better. Yeah. So the community has to be involved to say, all right, Mr. and Mrs. Investor, we're going to come in. You're going to drop this money here. But this, these are our needs. We need infrastructure. We need um, you know, additional commercial opportunities. Because again, what's going to help that community? What's going to sustain that community if there is no major retailer? Mm -hmm. If there are no uh, programs available for small business owners to open their shop, like we heard earlier? Yeah. Yeah. So again. The community has to demand that you can't just come here and build, you know, 24 unit luxury and price all of us out. You've got to help us. Um, and I think uh, there is area of opportunity for opportunity zones, and that is trying to find not for profit organizations. And again, maybe crowdsourcing and pooling. I'll leave that to you guys. Uh, you guys are the financial es experts. Yeah. But there, there are some opportunities. We've got to do our research to figure out how can we leverage uh, the dollars that are pouring into our communities to help those. Oh. Hi. Someone did not like that answer. That's right. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Yeah. 
So someone didn't like that answer on Opportunity yeah. Zone. But. So and I'm going to throw this to Bill because we have talked about this. Is you know, Where in the Opportunity Zone, Opportunity Fund law, is it possible to even have that kind of influence over the investments? Well, one of the things, again, working with uh, the congressman that uh, you and I have proposed is that you, so Opportunity Zones is a tax program. It's a tax scam uh, from the biggest real estate scammer we've ever seen, Donald J. Trump. What it is is if you bought a stock for 100 bucks five years ago and it goes up to 300 bucks, that means your gain is $200. And what this program says is you can take that $200, you can invest it in a poor community, and we won't tax you at all on that $200. If you invest that $200 and it goes up to a million dollars, how much tax do you pay on that gain between the difference? None, zero. So you know that the white boys are all over this, starting with Jared Kushner. Uh, uh, so it's, it, it's a program to basically allow uh, what are basically white real estate developers to take the gains that they've made over the past 30 years, including some of the gains that they've gotten from you by foreclosing unfairly on your house, and invest it back in your community. And if you have to hold on to the investment for 10 years to get that gain. Um, and by the way, you have to have invested by 12-31-2019. The reason I say that is what you're going to see between now and 12-31-2019 in all of your black communities, just don't be surprised by this, you're going to see a boatload of money coming. And you're going to wonder, where's all this, where's all this money coming? This is what's, what's going to kind of drive this. Uh, and there's no real way. What we've suggested is that that tax advantage should be tied to some type of social impact measurement, some type of anti-gentrification uh, uh, kind of tie. So that if you invest that and the neighborhood gentrifies, then you don't get all of that tax benefit, right? That would be the logical thing to do from an economic theory perspective. But the way this was set up was to rush this through. So what's going on right now, I was at a thing with the Republicans, man, it was, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It was disgusting. It really was. It was just the craziest thing ever. Because what they're doing is they're using the black football players who have accumulated capital like Emmett Smith and Chris Carter to be the front faces for these funds as they come into the black community. So what they're saying is, oh, no, no, we got Emmett Smith's fund. He's the lead investor. And he will be. And God bless him. He's going to make a lot of money. But he's going to be the minority, literally, partner with respect to the money. He's going to make a million dollars. The white guys are going to make a billion dollars, you know. So, so and driving you out of your community. So, so that's that's the issue with that. And we propose that they uh, have some type of uh, rule, regulation, uh, something that measures the uh, 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 social impact. Now, last thing I'll say, and Keevan hates it when I say this. But in terms of uh, an actual thing that the people in this room can do to make money over the long term, I'm going to tell you what to do. Something called Bitcoin. What? Right? Bitcoin. 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 Yes, buy $100 worth of Bitcoin on a platform called Coinbase. Just $100. Bitcoin is a digital currency. It's digital money. The government of China just announced that they are going to develop their own digital money. This is why I'm suggesting you buy this. This is huge validation for this particular type of money. And for, for those of you who are millennials, you know, 30 years from now, this is what you're going to be. You're not going to be using cash or even credit cards. You're going to be using stuff that's on your phone that you're going to, you know. So, so you, that's another area that's ripe for our participation that we haven't necessarily gotten into. And again, don't put the mortgage in, you know, $100, $100. Uh, because our forecast is that there's going to be a huge hack at Wells Fargo. We don't know when, but there's going to be a huge hack at Wells Fargo. And what's going to happen is it's going to drive people to Bitcoin and digital currencies. Because they, they, they'll say, you just can't trust the old system. You just can't trust it. So people are going to move globally, globally, you're going to see people moving into these new areas. Yeah. Manny Pacquiao started his own uh, 
cryptocurrency too. No, 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 no. No, no, no. See, this is the thing. I don't know. The cocks are about to say something. What the heck? Okay, yeah, okay. Go ahead, cocks. No, I, you know, I, I don't want folks to leave here. The one thing that I would advise everybody you know, who have, uh, you don't have to have any money to do this, but you got a presidential election that's coming up in a matter of months. You know, and you got candidates from this, in the Democratic uh, campaign, uh, nomination campaign. And Mill said earlier that the key to the black economy uh, is the black women. And uh, experts have said that the key to the Democratic presidential nomination is black women. <laughs> so black women control all the, the, in, in the black economy, and the black women control uh, the black uh, political process and future of the black community. And my point is, who is talking about the things that we're talking about here among any of the candidates? Not even the black candidates. You know, we cannot elect somebody because they said that they sat next to Obama. <laughs> Eight years ago. Only. That's the only platform. And then me and Obama was best buds four years ago. Now that's unintelligent in my, in my opinion. You know, we have got to really be very shrewd and self interested in terms of our present realities. And we want and we are going to be able to use the federal resources uh, adroitly and, 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 and to our, our best advantage because a lot of this stuff does emanate from the federal government and we need now a president who's fine tuned and very sensitive to the, to the black economy, even in ways that Obama wasn't. You know, I would, you know, hey, I like him and, he and uh, Michelle, I like, but I don't need to have his replacement. I, mean, I already got a picture of them in my living room, all right, that my grandkids have seen. I mean, I like the feeling of having a black, but I don't want to have his butt, his, his room dog. His picture up there. I want to have somebody who is really going to take the heart of uh, issues and help create a more robust uh, economy in the black community. Because understand now, the things that the Congress takes six years, 60 years to get done, a president can get it done overnight just by signing some or signing his name or writing a letter or whatever. He can get those things done. There's enormous power in the presidency. Uh, a president that makes us feel good, we're done with that. <laughs> Come on, y'all say it now. <laughs> I'm a preacher. Everybody say, we're done with that. We're done with that. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Let's get somebody in that White House who's going to work with us to create more banks, to create more black business, to make big calm. Bitcoin, workforce, help creator, and black economy, an international black economy that we can all buy in. Because our future as a people is directly connected to the advancement and the future of Africa in the diaspora. Uh -huh. Africa is going to, it, it would be, it's almost unintelligent for us as African Americans, 13% of the population. You know, to not have some kind of economic affinity, uh, economic partnership with a, with a continent of people where all most of the world's resources reside. And who are screaming 
for investment from this nation and from African Americans. And who also, I was in Rwanda, 70% of all the farmers in Rwanda are women. 70% of them. You know, so there are all, all these things are things that we can work with. They, you know, we are, we are the same and we just have to see it. Our future won't rest from Maine to California. It's really around the world. We are international people, and we ought to start thinking about the international global economy. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have one question, but then I'm gonna have one question for you, then if you guys have questions, we're gonna take Q&A, because it's um, 5.19, so we're gonna start to run out of time, so we wanna get questions from the audience. But you know, all of this, he said, you know, talking, picking up what the Congress said about Neil. Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, what do you see as the future of black beauty, black beauty supply, black, you know, all, it seems to me that we're underutilizing our black beauty businesses. Talk about that. I mean, what, what do we need to do? What's happening? What's the strategy? I think for me, ownership has be, has, is the key, you know. Um, Miss Jessie's wouldn't be the, the company we are today had we not had the support of people who live in our communities, people who have the same experiences as, as us. They were the people who supported us. So instead of you know maybe going to the Jewish meat market or the Korean you know um, food market or the Chinese nail salon, you know opening up businesses where we can patronize our businesses, I found that that has become a very very su successful way for me to build uh, capital for my business, my family, but also for us to create communities and. Um, I, I, again, I think ownership is the key. Instead of us um, going to other people for the services and the products we need, um, it'd be really nice to buy from someone um, from, from our communities who, who experience in the same way that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. While we're getting questions for Lori, is it, I just, you know, just in, I was in Rwanda, I was in Ghana and Rwanda last month, and I met a, a young man who was, uh, who lived in the States for a, long, for a while. He worked at Johnson Products Company. He took all that he learned from it. He went back and he opened up a uh, hair products, uh, uh, what is, uh, making hair products. And his goal is to sell Johnson uh, soft sheen like products throughout all of Africa. So he's, got, he's trying to capture a market that is really, you know, maybe half a million, half a million people, half a million people. So I think that maybe in this product is called MVP products. And so maybe you can, because he's going, he's trying to sell hair products to all of Africa. I think that anybody that want to invest in some business or the future, hair products has been proven one of the ways of, of realizing the wealth through hair products. I guess you call it business development, your business development strategies. <laughs> I have a quick story about the beauty business, the black beauty business, and the power that we have as consumers. You know, Titi and I got a call from Target. We didn't believe it was Target because it was a third party who invited us, two girls from Brooklyn, to join the shelves, Target nationwide. Um, we were excited. We had no lawyer. We signed every single contract and agreement in order to get into Target. And we had no, we didn't have a, um, we didn't have a full understanding as to why we got the call. We were just excited. In hindsight, I believe that the work that we were doing in Brooklyn, where we were showing people how, what the possibilities were in terms of what God gave us naturally, in terms of the texture of our hair and what we can do with it, I believe that each one of us taught the other person to relax their, excuse me, the relax their sales in Target, Walmart, and Walgreens were down 30%, which was a big number for those large retailers. 
so much that they called these two girls from Brooklyn and invited us to join the Target shelves because you guys stopped buying relaxers. Mm -hmm. You know, so what, <laughs> so what you were doing is you were, you were patronizing, you were supporting businesses like Miss Jessie's, mom and pop shops who were doing uh, hair services illegally in our Brooklyn Brownstone on Hancock Street between Bedford and Nostrand Avenue. Uh, <laughs> Going on the end, speaking of real estate, very early on, we decided that in order for us to be owners of our own business, it was important for us to own the business and the building which we operated from. So what we did in 1999 was purchase the brownstone in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, which in 1999 was known as the Bonafide Hood. And we did it during a time, that's right, and we did it during a time when you looked around, you saw all black faces. We bought a brownstone in 1999 for $215,000. They were asking $245,000. We had some negotiating skills and knocked some of that money off. But now next door to us is nothing. Next door sold for $3.5 million. Wow. And then across the street, another $3.2 million. So that, that initial investment, that ownership, that control, that power, that fortress where we built our business also was gaining and earning um, value, you know? So, you know, you asked me in the beginning, what are your solutions? What do you think we should do? Um, I don't have the answer to that question, but so far for me, ownership has, has been the key, you know, in every aspect of the way. So I'm not gonna be fighting with a Korean woman about my nails because I'm gonna go to a place where they know how I wanna be treated. And then I can help her build her business the way you help me build our business. And although we don't discriminate, we hire white, black, Spanish, gay, lesbian, whatever you call it, but you know, it's not uncommon to see a bunch of black faces in Miss Jessie's, you know? So we're able to now, with the support that we got from you guys, be able to build and offer jobs and build the communities that way and give back in a meaningful way. Okay, Questions? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Mike. Hi, my name is Aquantis Warren, QDQ Global Incorporated. Quick question. That's my business. Um, since you were talking about we were buying in our communities the hair products, but now you know you said Target had um, called them and said, "Hey, we want you." But now a lot of now a lot of that's going on. You got Walmart, you got Target, you got um, CVS, everybody's Walgreens. So we are buying our products, but now you guys are not getting the full price, or do they give you a nice cut to, to sell in their stores? Oh, excuse me. And then if we tar if we partner with Target and they had 1,700 stores and we gave them some margin, we did some math and we thought that maybe we could make more money partnering with Walmart or Target or Walgreens because of their distribution. We weren't able to hit as many people at one time as we are, you know, on the shelves with their kind of distribution. So we thought that that was a good move. So although we're not getting the full profit of one jar. Um, targeted to 50 people, we're able to touch a whole bunch more people by just breaking some, breaking some of that off with Target, Walmart, Walgreens, and CVS. Anybody else? Me. Ingrid. And then you might can hear me. Can you hear me? Thank you. Oh, no. 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 Good evening. So um, I'm Falasha Day, the accountability accountant. I work with small businesses, and I'm actually on the way with you guys, but I work to help create more jobs and to bring stability. And so one of the questions I came here to ask was, what could we do? So no one seems to be able to answer that. So now when I'm looking at what I do in terms of the businesses, 
I feel like there's a, a strong gap between policy and our businesses. Mm -hmm. Where do we go to bring bridge that gap? Are you guys communicating with accountants like myself and giving us the tools and the direction to push our clients into direction to investments or to this investor or to this venture capitalist so they can get off the ground? The biggest struggle I'm seeing is that we're taking the leap of faith to start the businesses, but the access to capital, mm -hmm. the business acumen, mm -hmm. the resources, the connections, the discipline, the grit, we don't have it. What do we need to do to do that? And what could I do to better serve our community to be able to do that? So I'm going to, I'm all about plan of action, immediate plan of action. And I think most of us forget that uh, a lot of the larger corporations have to have a minority interest. So I would say step one for any small business is to get certified. Are you minority-owned business, woman-owned business? Uh, those are going to provide additional opportunities for you to make income streams. So for example, uh, one of the big developers, for example, may have to have a requirement that they hire a 25% minority-owned business. All you've done is pre present yourself as a qualified candidate, and you're you know, going to get 25% of a $10 million commercial contract, for example. But we don't educate ourselves about that. We don't go through the process, and we don't share the knowledge the with the next business owner that's coming behind us. That's the problem. We don't even have the financial statements to be able to even apply for the certification. It's easiest to get certified when you're not making any money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, on that point, I'd recommend that you go. So we did a webinar. The webinar for black women seeking capital it was mentioned in uh, Black Enterprise. It's a class on Udemy. One of the things we've noticed is you've got all of these funds that have popped up now that are focused on black women. <clears throat> so just knowing who they are, number one. Uh, number two, one of the things, in terms of connecting policy, here's actually what I would suggest. If you look at the House Financial Services Committee, four of the six committees are run by black people. In the history of the United States Congress, there's never been a committee where four, and I'm, I'm getting there, this is a long-winded, you know, uh, four of the, of the uh, there's never been a committee where that many black people have been in charge. It's never happened before, and it probably won't happen again. So just reaching out to those committee chair people with a letter, an email, just real quick, you know. Uh, and I know that's, again, it's a long way from that level down to the street uh, where you are. I get it, you know. But the, the fact is that this is kind of an unusual situation. So, uh, and then, did I mention MinorityFinance.com? So no. we have, since 1998, run a website called MinorityFinance.com where we try to provide all of this information that, that you need for free in an objective kind of way. I mean, there's no easy way. I mean, obviously, we, there are all kinds of articles, studies about how hard it is to start a business, even if you're not a minority woman. But if you're an African woman, it's even harder. You know, but written determination first. But, you know, and then asking, you know, you, it's, it's a lot of research. You know, we'll trade information and we'll put, you know, we work with, you know, incubators. You know, there are all those different ways. But it's a process. It's, you know, one other thing I would suggest, uh, look to the SBA. <clears throat> You know, the SBA is an is underutilized agency that's really whose mission it is to promote, help promote and expand small businesses. Use, utilize the SBA, get to know the SBA personnel, the regional director, the local director, look, the manager of the SCORE program. You know, uh, and, and if you're having a problem, then use your member of Congress who has the ear of the SBA. Utilize that person also, your local election official. And uh, it's a counterpart to the SBA that exists at the state level. So use your state members of the general assembly. And they might even be at the local level. So learn how to use your government officials to help you um, along the way to help answer some questions, all right, and to help give you access. Thank you. Hello, thank you all for your time and your knowledge. I'm very appreciative to be in the space. Um, my name is Ayana Ford. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the executive <laughs> director at the Future Foundation. I'm also an eighth generation native Washingtonian from Ward 8. 
So for anyone who's familiar with DC, that is the, in the term that you use, the bona fide hood. Um, what I'm finding in this space, and I just felt like you are some folks I'd like to hear thoughts on, is that the hood is a term that's kind of looked down on, that there's a lot of performative politics, that there are a lot of conversations of, I did this, and this is what you should be doing as well. But I live in a community where one grocery store services 125,000 people, and most of it's expired. Um, a lot of people don't have lights. We're just now getting 5G, and those we're just getting bike lanes in Ward 8. So being able to actually make these conversations, just the conversation accessible, is difficult for a mom who's a third generation teen mom and can't fully read. And so to you all, one, I know the role that intergenerational trauma plays in that, because I do do trauma-informed work with the young people and families there. But I want to hear from you all what you think the role trauma plays in that is, and how you think each of us as individuals, whether we own a business or not, can really work to bridge that gap, since being in this space means you have a certain level of access and opportunity, whether you use it or not. Wow. That's a deep question. So <laughs> first thing I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to do, I'm a native Washingtonian. The only area in Washington that does not have a fully functional hospital is Ward 8 and mm -hmm. Ward 7. The rate of black women dying in childbirth is the highest in Washington, D.C. than it is in the entire United States of America with the mayor who ostensibly is a black female. The reason why, I'm going to I'm I'm break it down for you. Why, why is that? The reason is, is that as a as a white real estate developer, the last thing you want is for the population that you've just driven out of the area to repopulate. Therefore, you're going to take away any resource that you can identify that would increase the probability of that repopulation. The key asset is a hospital. You got one in Georgetown, you got Georgetown, you got GW, you got all great hospitals, world class, Johns Hopkins University. But you don't have one in Ward 7 or Ward 8. Why the hell is that? So, so in terms of, of physical trauma now, and that also leads to mental trauma. There's no question about it. You know, um, I would suggest kind of advocate. And I've been, I've said the same statement in front of the D.C. City Council, which is why they don't invite me back. <laughs> but, so, I would encourage you to really reach out and to hit these guys hard to get that. You need a freaking hustle. And here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. When Ward 7 and Ward 8 are 60% white, do you think that they will have a hospital? Yes. So it's not a question of them not being able to put a hospital there. It's a question of timing. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm strong in terms of advocating for just, just a simple frame. They have no hospital. It is the craziest thing. So anybody else? Yeah, I'll just mention a, a quick thing real quick. I think there's a lot we could say about like the systemic oppression, marginalization, and disinvestment from all black communities in like all urban areas in this country, driven by everything from redlining to like the migrations after slavery, um, all the way you know to 10 years ago to mass incarceration. I think there's speaking of what um, of what Bill mentioned about kind of like physical trauma. You know, there's some studies on the impact of like mass incarceration, not just on the people who are incarcerated, but the public health of their children, other people in their households, you know, for everything from behavioral issues in school to asthma, just all the adverse impacts that has. I feel like we will still be measuring that stuff for decades to come, even though we can kind of see the impacts of it already without quantifiable numbers necessarily. So there's like a ton of time to stay there to say nothing of housing uh, and economic development. Like, But I do want to shout out a thing in DC in particular that I think is so notable is like, I actually feel like DC is more disenfranchised in some ways because of the lack of statehood, because of the lack of representation in Congress, the lack of ability to weigh in on federal policy in that way. And so I think, um, you know, I have been lucky enough kind of in my, in my personal capacity outside of work to be able to learn from a lot of folks who are doing um, anti-gentrification work, community organizing, and locally based advocacy in DC. And like, I think all I can say is like, I feel like I've seen those folks do amazing things banding together and like fighting for particular things in communities because a lot of the current system and the economy is not set up, again, to center the success of the people who have been suffering from this disinvestment over years and years, right? So it's like, 
oh, like DC's numbers are up on a certain thing like employment or amount of new businesses opening or the level of particular investment flowing in the community, but it's not looking at all those specific things like who is profiting from that investment, who are the jobs going to, what is the quality of the jobs, basic things like access to groceries and healthcare, you know? And so I think another thing that I, that I would say, not really, as, not as a recommendation, but just that something that I try to keep in mind is like, again, flipping that idea like, a city cannot be economically prosperous if the most marginalized people in it are not prospering, right? So it's like, if we flip that idea of like, okay, DC is a city on the up and up, like it's renewing, it's rejuvenating, et cetera. Like, can it be doing all of those things if the folks in Ward 8 aren't thriving? Like, no. Um, so that's just something I would think about, just that, that really like community focused approach and like changing our idea of what we consider to be success. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you all for being here. Hey, my name is Tavares Marks. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. And my question is kind of pretty much straightforward. I'm, uh, I'm a 36-year-old, uh, currently PhD student. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of education, but I also have a lot of student loan debt. Right now, I'm about $85,000. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's still a lot, you know. Uh, but um, you know, I recently bought my first home about four years ago, so I don't have a lot of equity in my home. I say all this because uh, my family left us, well, left me about 10, acre, 10 acres of land in a rural part of Virginia. And you know, the last couple of years, I've gotten an entrepreneurial bug, and I want to be my own boss, I want to own something. And I'm very interested in hemp and cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I put together a business plan, and I approached three banks for a $40,000 loan to buy additional 10 acres as well as some farming equipment. Well, first, I'm not, I'm not I never grew up on a farm. I don't know anything about farming, but I have a great idea, and I know that you know, due to the farm bill reclassifying hemp as booming right now, and I, I really feel that marijuana within the next two years will be legalized in Virginia. I want to be ahead of the curve. I'm having trouble getting that money I need to get that loan. As I said, I've been turned down by three banks, and my debt to income ratio is too high. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out: is there any other resources I should be looking into uh, to possibly try to find that 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 funding, and you know how anything else you guys suggest for individuals like myself who battle with student loans and having that just dragging down your credit or whatever. Anytime you go ask for money, that's the first thing they bring up student loans. But I'm like, well, damn it, I, I get to school, be smart. So I mean, there's an investment. That was an investment, so I'm going to get a return on the investment, but I can't get a return if I can't really do what I want to do. So my question is, anything that I should be looking at to possibly get that, that funding I need? So I'll say on the cannabis. Piece, that it, there are a lot of venture capital opportunities out there. I mean, it's very, it's still a very competitive marketplace. I mean, raising money is very hard. Um, we're working on some, tomorrow. There's an event about blacks and cannabis, particularly. Um, you know, you plug into the go online, plug into all the different organizations dealing with cannabis. There's like five or six hundred of them probably in this area. He probably knows one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. So, just to be helpful, um, I'm Xavier Warren. I work for Congressional Partners. We help people pursue federal funding for their needs. Um, one of the things to be very helpful for anybody who has any business idea, and this is something you can do right away. There's a lot of, I'm sure you're all familiar with grants, but there's, you know, you have community foundation in your local city or county, et cetera. You have a lot of foundations. You could actually submit for like a planning grant to like one of these community foundations or other foundations in your area. And all you have to do is submit a concept paper and they award you between like $25,000, $30,000 and give you a decision within 30 days for you be able to actually go out there and plan any business idea you want. The reason why they do this is because they actually want to have jobs in their area. Uh, a lot of counties, and especially rural counties in this area, and you said specifically your land is in rural Virginia. I'm from rural Virginia, Danville, Virginia. But uh, they're having like brain, um, brain drain right now because a lot of people are moving to urban areas. So they are trying to find ways to be able to generate jobs in their area. So you could actually go out there, apply for a grant, you'll get a decision in 30 days, get 25, 25,000, 25,000 to like $35,000 to actually plan your work, then go return the next year and apply for an implementation grant. I mean, these, a lot of these programs, they have their state grants, there's municipal grants, there are community foundation grants. All of these programs, they are really like in the open. If you have a business idea, if you have a concept, go in there, apply for some type of planning grant, 
um, have a you know a good plan, concept paper, it'd be three to five pages, and they'll invite you. They want further information, they'll invite you for maybe another full proposal. But you know, that's that's well, just some information that's yeah. <clears throat> Also another another part of this, brother, is you know, no uh, no no overlook your the your African American and the uh, elected members of the general general assembly who's gonna vote on the cannabis legislation to create uh, legalized uh, marijuana in Virginia and make sure that you work with them, hold them accountable so that in the base, in the base leg legislation, they will have provisions to create some funding for African Americans who, uh, who want to start getting to their business. All right, they can make the majority owners or the, or the, the white business people, and they can make them provide dollars to you, all right, to open up a, a cannabis operation. And that should happen in all of these states where cannabis is being legalized. These uh, African Americans and whites who represent uh, black communities, they should be held accountable to create some aspect of a legislation to create a fund there to help uh, blacks who want to get into that industry. Gwen Hurt, uh, sir, sir. Gwen Hurt, shoe crazy wine. Gwen Hurt, shoe crazy wine. Gwen Hurt is an African American female in Richmond, Virginia, who created her own wine company. They got into Walmart. So she faced exactly the same issue that, that you faced. And the reason I'm recommending you reach out to her, so go to Shoe Crazy Wine. I don't see you reaching for your phone. Shoe, <laughs> shoecrazywine.com and send her a message. The reason is she went through this exercise over the course of the past year, where she re there's a credit union in Richmond that she talked to. Um, Richmond Heritage? Is it Richmond Heritage? I, I, yeah, I, but it's not just the credit union. I'm just starting there. There's also a black church that makes investments in black businesses uh, in Richmond. You probably know a lot of these people. So all I'm suggesting is that you compare notes with Gwen Hurt, because she went through this exact same thing, could not, got a contract for 600 Walmart stores for her wine, could not get a loan from any white bank. With that contract, walked in with a freaking contract for Walmart. No, we're sorry. We get you. Yeah. You're gonna face the same thing. So, but she was able to work it out. But she did a lot of the legwork. She looked at all of these sources. So rather than reinventing the wheel, just go talk to Winter. What if? Great. And hi, my name is Carrie Davis, and I'm with Wealth Watchers. And specifically, I want to respond to this gentleman because that was going to be a question that I have. So as you have your phone back out, I want you to put in RMAP, that's Rural Micro Entrepreneur Assistance Program, RMAP. And that's a program through USDA which provides loans for micro entrepreneurs in rural areas where they can be a lot more flexible in terms of working with you, in terms of your debt, et cetera. I know because I'm an RMAP lender in Jacksonville, Florida. And one of the things that we did is we worked, we started working in rural areas for just this reason alone. Because a lot of the work that we're talking about now, a lot of the barriers as it relates to home ownership, businesses, all of us are somewhere near a rural area. And in rural areas, a lot of these barriers are taken away because there are entry points into rural areas. As the gentleman said, they're begging people to come back to rural areas. So you can come into rural areas and you can get into home ownership at 3% interest rate, no mortgage insurance. You can get access to $50,000 of capital with minimal underwriting standards. So my question is, how do we encourage more of our young people and people interested in doing businesses to have an economic migration back to rural areas where not only are those capitals available, but every year they're sending it back because it's going unspent? 
I think outreach is one of the things we found is that outreach to our to our communities is, is scant. I mean, people don't know about the opportunities, and I assume that that is one of the big things. It's one of the things we find all over the place that people don't know, especially high school kids, kids in college. You know, I talked to a uh, to a super school superintendent about the airline pilot shortage. He said, you know, I never would have thought about suggesting that my kids become pilots. So if, you, if we don't teach them, they never know. And so I think that's the number one thing. If anyone else has a different opinion or another idea. Thank you. If we don't teach them, we never know. This perfect segue. My name is Katrina Robinson. I'm a first term state senator in, in Tennessee. Um, prior, thank you. <laughs> Prior to this, in 2015, I wrote a federal grant that awarded me $1.6 million to start an operation that impacted workforce and healthcare in our community by building a healthcare career college for students in Memphis. Now, Memphis has a 25% poverty rate, 39% of those are, chi are children. Um, the challenge that I'm facing right now is I want so much to be able to translate the federal programs and the state programs to our underserved communities and be able to execute those, but I have not seen it done anywhere successfully. So my question to you, Brother Cunningham or, or Congressman Bush, what is it, I'm sorry, Rush, what is it, that, what is it that we can do in order to make it happen locally for those who are not as astute or who are not as aware of the programs that we have federally? It's, it's, there's, a, there's a gap between policy and execution. Have you seen it done somewhere before um, successfully? So it's not either, I guess the answer, short answer is because we do a lot of community work. It's consistency. I mean, you have to go in all the time. People tend to go in and do one event or one outreach and then forget about it. I mean, if you aren't, you have to do this almost bi-weekly, if not quarterly, wherever you are, just to, to get five people a day. If you get five people each time you do something, you're making real progress. That's our experience. I'll let everyone else talk, but our experience is that it's a lot of repetition. Well, let me clarify. Have you all seen an actual local program that has taken a federal program and executed on a local level, like a, a structured program? Yeah, Where, yeah. Whether we're talking about yeah, pooling yeah. or crowdfunding? Yeah, yeah. Whether we're taking them, whether we're programs or uh, other climate change kind of programs. But let's see. Taking one of the resignation programs, federal dollars come to the state or the local government, and no state or local government has to employ uh, local businesses in order, to, uh, in order to make homes and business uh, energy efficient. And that's a federal program that federal dollars come to, to the state. And and there are a number of local businesses, not enough, uh, who, uh, who are into weather realization. There's a lot of federal dollars now going for you know, weather realization. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there are some success stories along those lines. But another part, part of the answer is that you know, uh, I, I, we have to look at the centers of influence in our own community and where they are located at. And <clears throat> I think that the churches are, in terms of these kinds of uh, efforts, from how do we position churches uh, and uh, to be the uh, center of economic activity, you know, we have to really start expanding what we use our churches for. You know, they just gave me, you know, two hours a, 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 a week and close now. So we have to use, you know, I would suggest using some of our churches to become economic engines uh, in terms of sharing information, helping to rate, develop uh, uh, an economic consciousness so that we will be able to encourage people to uh, become entrepreneurs to seek out opportunities. You know, uh, there's a scripture that says, you know, you have to be uh, lenders rather than borrowers. You know, we gotta take that to heart. We gotta really try to uh, make our churches 
more relevant to our overall economy as they used to be. Julia? So there's a guy, I think he's in Memphis, named Carnell Scruggs. Do you know Carnell? No, I don't. He's a commercial, he's a brother who's a black commercial real estate. Carnell Scruggs, so mm -hmm. uh, please reach out to him. The other group is the Beek Center at Georgetown University, B-E-E-C-K Center, uh, for social entrepreneurship. Now they claim that they want to do exactly what you said. They claim that they want to, I haven't seen them work with any black people. Uh, on it, <laughs> but give them a call. You know, I could be wrong and see if because you're perfectly positioned. That's a great, it's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think another thing I would just tack on to that. Sorry, in terms of like federal. Oh no, no, it's okay. Um, just in terms of like federal funding going to different communities directly to do not like one specific project, but kind of like sustained repeated programs or, you know. Yeah, what I'm really getting at is like a systemic way to do it. So say for instance, we have small business innovation research yeah. grants or we have yeah. um, opportunity zones. Yeah. Has, has it been done somewhere that I can look at and repeat? So I think one of the problems is, I think my answer is like, yes, it has been done in a lot of places, but it is not always in predominantly black communities or predominantly poor communities. It's happening, right? Like one of the first things that came to mind for me is like the fund at the Department of Housing and Urban Development that specifically funds things like sewers, like building local parks, fixing sidewalks, like all of the things that are off, off of schools and off of people's private property, you know, that still need to be touched up for like building accessible, livable communities that people can get around, right? Those are being utilized like all the time. I can't say that I know the numbers on like whether or not they're actually going to places that are like uh, in poverty, that have, that have that systemic disinvestment, or whether it's like a pot that like the same communities are just like dipping into over and over. Right. So I'm, I'm not as sure, like I don't have a specific example just in terms of like that level of disinvestment, but it's like they are happening all the time and they're functioning. It's just, I think they're, they're not being used by the folks who need them most. Right. Exactly. Okay. Just add, um, workforce, um, because you were talking about uh, developing the healthcare workforce. Um, the Markle Foundation has done a pilot program looking at workforce development, but to um, Sam's point, they are focusing on Colorado and they're focusing, I think, also a little bit on South Carolina, so presumably there are some black communities involved in that. And so that's one um, additional uh, model you can look at because there have been a lot of both um, government but also foundations that are looking at you know plussing up and, and scaling workforce development programs and so that could be one additional resource focus on workforce thank you thank you for your work also yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to expound on the gentleman's observation about trying to seek funding for the, the, the 10 or so acres that he may have in Virginia the U.S. Department of Agriculture has funds for a minority or new f landowner or farmer. Only thing he has to do is go and submit his application, whatever. I would encourage also anyone who owns any land, 10 acres, 20 acres, 5 acres, whatever, hold and keep your property. <laughs> it is so important that you do that. The land conservation program, as we meet here in this facility today, the land conservation program with USDA that's written in the Farm Bill is a hush, hush topic. It goes way back over 100 years of how funds were distributed. And it's, and it's, been, it's being done the same way now. Across the country, there are conservation districts and in the farm bill, they have got it written now. You must have had, have farmed the land for so many years before you can participate in the pro conservation program. The conservation program can take and hand you a half million dollar check. Take it and hand it to you. There's no credit requirements, no nothing. If you, get, if you are participating in the program, you have a certain amount of land to do it. But you can't do anything when you don't own the land. So I encourage you, whatever property you may have, and you'll be surprised across this country who is participating in far USDA and the, the conservation program and farming. If you want to go to grow flowers, the government is, is, is making loans for that. You want to grow cabbage or whatever, you'd be surprised to know who is getting USDA money. Thank okay. you. One last question, and then we got, I got one announcer to make and we got to close it out, so go ahead. Sure. 
Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Mr. Cunningham, when I saw the number that you put up for $25 billion in lost wages, I guess my, uh, my question for all of you is because I think we'd be misinformed to think that all of that, if more than 10 percent, is even going to be spent in the black community. And so I'm wondering if, if you all have a strategy on, on a national level of how we can actually keep more dollars in the African American community. Uh, I'm in wealth management, my wife's in real estate, and there's nothing more disheartening, you know, you stated before, uh, you know, with, with realtors, there are black people that are buying homes, but they may not necessarily be using a realtor that looks like them. Um, there are plenty of small businesses that are black owned that, um, you know, offer consumer staples um, from, you know, people that are building homes, people that are, you know, selling clothes. Uh, but for whatever reason, we just don't have an organized channel to incorporate those individuals in our lives because if it's not easy, it, it just doesn't seem to get done anymore. And, and so I just wanted to get, uh, you know, the panel's take on how we can really incorporate um, empowering small businesses, even if we have to drive a little bit out of our way to get to them and support them. Uh, well, yeah. I'll jump. So uh, there is a lady that created a, a book back in the 1980s called Shopping for Good. And it was, uh, the if you Google that, it was kind of the start of this ESG, social responsible investing. Uh, she, what she did was she took a look at a company and she said, look, let me look at all their policies, environmental, uh, uh, human rights, that sort of thing. And then attach it to specific products with a barcode thing. I think that's kind of the idea that the congressman uh, has talked about in terms of, we, we need another one of those. So the issue is data in kind of creating a Facebook type tech uh, 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 vehicle that would provide all of this information in terms of uh, black companies, in terms of the non-black products, kind of a rating of, uh, in terms of their friendliness to black people. You get a five star rating, you know, uh, on your phone where you scan the barcode and it pulls up, hey, this company sucks for black people, you know? Um, you know one star, something like that, you, you could do that. And, and again, we've seen it done with the technology. So, and extending that into the list of black businesses, you know, lowering that search cost uh, to the minimum, I think, would be something to do. Just there's, my, right, I guess there's also an organization called Shop Black. That, I, that was served by two Howard uh, grads that is doing something similar, uh, just kind of aggregating the information on black businesses that um, could also be useful. Thank you. Listen, guys, I'm sorry, we're, we're at 6 o'clock. They're going to kick us out of the room. But before we go, tomorrow the congressman's doing uh, another brain trust. Uh, it's, uh, call, Ken Burns did a, like a documentary, College Behind Bars. And it's here, it's in room 143 tomorrow from 2 to 4 p.m. So hopefully you guys can make that too. Uh, thank you for being a great audience. Thank you for coming. Well, let, let me, if I could, this, this uh, uh, Ken Burns documentary is going to be released on PBS sometime later this month. And he's going to preview it tomorrow uh, here from uh, 2 to 4. 2 to 4. 2 to 4. And it's really about some. Uh, uh, Marlon College has uh, uh, a campus inside the prison. And they've got some young men who have really uh, done some remarkable academic work uh, behind Mars and a couple of their debate teams have reached international uh, renown because uh, one of their debate teams meet Harvard University in a, in a uh, the main contest, they, they actually made Harvard University look like it was in prison and they, got it and they were released. So uh, I would encourage you to come and see what work is being done uh, and is being uh, recognized. Uh, Ken Burns is not just an ordinary documentary uh, maker, he's an uh, award winning uh, documentarian and he's actually going to be here and be a part of the panel, including some of the other uh, former inmates who were, uh, who were uh, came to his Mark College Behind the Wall program. All right, everybody, thank you very much. <laughs>